My name is David Ignatius. Uh, I am a columnist for the Washington Post and the co-moderator with Fareed Zakaria of a website called Post Global. And I want to welcome you on this uh, snowy Davos morning to Tehran. Uh, I had the pleasure uh, this year of traveling to Iran for two weeks. Uh, and perhaps like many of you, I had an impression, not having been there, uh, that I was going to a very regimented uh, society. I had images of a kind of Muslim North Korea. And when I got there, I found that this was a place where there was surprisingly wide open debate in every part of society that I encountered, uh, talking to university professors, talking to people in think tanks, uh, th talking to merchants in the bazaar, talking even to government officials. It was a place where there was a lot of talk, a lot of stimulating debate about the future of Iran, uh, and uh, that was an element that I didn't understand. In other words, uh, in Tehran, there were all these voices. So my hope is that this morning we can recreate for you a little bit of the feeling of being at a dinner party in Tehran or being at one of the meetings of uh, one of our panelists, Dr. Adelie's uh, think tank in Tehran, and hear the, those, uh, those voices. So let me begin by, by introducing uh, the members of our panel. To my immediate left, uh, Hussein Adli was a, a member of the Iranian uh, Foreign Ministry. Um, he was the governor of the Iranian Central Bank. He was the ambassador of Iran to London uh, and is now head of the think tank that I referred to, the name of which is uh, the Center for Economic and International Studies in, in Tehran. Uh, to my far left, Bahare Arvin is a researcher uh, in social studies in Tehran. She took her BA in political science and her MA in sociology at Tehran University in 2005, so she's a recent graduate. Um, in between those two panelists is Sharia Evazadeh Kaljahi, I hope I've pronounced that right, who's CEO of Genesis Sky, which is a software consultancy in Tehran and is a representative of a really quite dynamic technology sector. To my immediate right, uh, Vali Nasser uh, is uh, well known to many of us as the author of a book that's received wonderful reviews in the United States, The Shia Revival. He is an adjunct fellow of the Council on Foreign Relations uh, and teaches at the Naval Postgraduate School uh, in, uh, in California. So he is an Iranian, but is an Iranian now resident in, in the United States. And to his right, uh, Mohammad Reza Jalipur took his uh, BA in political science at Tehran University uh, and is now studying at Oxford in, in Britain for his PhD. So let me open um, this discussion and turn to uh, D Dr. Adli and ask him about a question that I know he thinks about a lot. Um, and that is uh, the, the Iranian economy and its connection with the world that Davos, that this conference re represents. I, in your mind, uh, is, is Iran uh, ready to play in the global economy? Uh, and does Iran want to play in the global economy? This is a, a country that's facing the sanctions, initially limited sanctions imposed by the United Nations, um, uh, which is going to cause problems. Maybe you could talk about that as well. Uh, well, David, let me begin with uh, uh, informing you that uh, the Iranian economy during the wartime uh, until 1989 was a very controlled uh, economy. Uh, it was a war economy, uh, in fact. But after that, uh, Iran embarked on a number of ambitious reforms, uh, applying new reforms uh, to the economy, the liberalization, deregulation, privatization, uh, and uh, more uh, market-oriented economy. <clears throat> and of course, uh, from there, uh, it started to grow and grow fast. Uh, the average uh, GDP growth rate per annum in the past uh, 17 years has been something around 6.5%, which is uh, quite acceptable. Of course, in the first years, it used to be something around 8 to 10%. And, uh, but then it, was, uh, it came down a little bit. Uh, and uh, now we have uh, been able to develop a, a good uh, financial market, uh, stock exchange. Now we are the uh, largest economy in the region, a little bit more than a uh, Turkish economy with something around $560 billion on, of course, PPP scale. Uh, the uh, per capita income is something around 
$8,100. Uh, and uh, we have uh, gone through a number of uh, reforms in the past uh, 17 years in uh, uh, three, uh, four, in four uh, five-year economic plans, which uh, have all been quite consistent uh, because all of the reforms have been followed by uh, the uh, successive programs. Uh, in the past 17 years, we have never been under multilateral sanctions as to the sanctions which you refer to. Uh, we have been under uh, unilateral sanctions of the United States, something around 10 executive orders and uh, one ILSA uh, was uh, law which was uh, passed against Iran. But uh, all of these uh, have never been that much uh, uh, affecting Iran adversely, as a matter of fact. Uh, because uh, it has been replaced by uh, uh, Europeans, by uh, the Chinese, Japanese. Uh, before uh, 27 years, uh, our first trading partner was the United States, but now our first trading partner is China. It used to be, uh, and there is no wonder, of course, uh, it used to be 10 years ago, we, our first trading partner was uh, Germany and the second one was Japan. But now, is, uh, first is China, second is Germany, and then third is, is Korea. And then it goes to, to Japan and the others. Uh, as to the openness, the uh, uh, reforms that we have been following in the past 17 years all have been uh, market-oriented uh, uh, reforms, which calls for openness. At one time in 1997, uh, at the first year of President Khatami's administration, we applied for membership of WTO, uh, which uh, indicates, is a very strong indicator of the Iranian willingness to participate in the world economy. But of course, uh, it was, uh, we, we are not able to get in so far. We have uh, become an observer and we are ready to negotiate. That would uh, largely affect the economy in terms of its openness because there are lots of conditionalities and requirements that uh, as a result of membership in the WTO, we would be much more open. So I think in general, Iran is quite willing to uh, get more open. Uh, the economy has reached to the stage where it cannot expand unless it uh, opens. Uh, the manufacturing sector has uh, expanded and has grown uh, to, to a uh, considerable degree, and it needs now new markets outside of the country. Uh, we used to be exporting some uh, a few hundred dollars of a few hundred million dollars of non-oil export. Now we are exporting something around 15 billion dollars of non-oil export. Oil accounts for just 25 uh, percent of our GDP. So non-oil exports and non-oil uh, manufacturing products are increasing and uh, there are lots of jobs that uh, have been created by that. Of course, we uh, have always been uh, facing the challenge of uh, both inflation and unemployment because of the uh, uh, baby boom that we had and the uh, young uh, population that we have. And um, as to the uh, uh, recent uh, uh, sanctions that you uh, refer to, uh, we hope that it would not, because for the time being, it's something that uh, is restricted to uh, the uh, uh, dual-use uh, uh, products, which might be uh, uh, good for the nuclear enrichment, and it's enrichment-related, and it's missile-related. But uh, we hope that that would stop at that uh, point, and it would not expand. Let me, Sharia, you're in this economy. Um, you're an entrepreneur. You have a business uh, that you're running in Tehran. I, I'm curious what you would say about these economic issues. For you as a businessman, do you feel uh, constricted by an economy that, that still has a very large state sector? Um, what do you as a businessman see, and what, what changes would you like to see? Actually, I sh uh, should say that. Um, the high-tech sector of uh, Iran uh, is a quiet, growing sector, and uh, there are lots of opportunities. Of course, um, in high-tech, it's uh, really needed to be in connection with other countries of the world, and uh, that uh, can be a problem. 
uh, not by, from our side, but uh, from the, the other side. But uh, the huge amount of uh, people who are um, eager to apply for usage of technology make a big market. Yes, it's a growing market, quite. So, so you're obviously, you're, this is a place you're happy to be and are making money. Uh, not at the moment, but I hope in the future. <laughs> <laughs> I think others, you're not the only high-tech entrepreneur who would say that here. Let, Vali, uh, let, me, let me turn to you and ask you if you would give us a sense of the political debate in, in Iran today. We note that there were municipal elections uh, in Tehran last month and that uh, the Iranian president, um, whose speeches uh, 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 make people in the West quite anxious uh, often, um, did not do well in the, in the municipal elections in Tehran and that his candidates did not do well in some of the uh, regional elections as well. But give us your sense from uh, reading the Iranian press uh, of what's going on politically. Well, uh it, it was, they were uh, they were very interesting elections. I think uh, they highlight the fact that Iran is a country that's not easily put in, in any basket, any easy classification that we think of in the, in the Middle East. Uh, the, it is often seen as a theocracy, as an authoritarian regime. Uh, those aspects are there, but also it has real politics. Uh, Iranians vote. They take their voting very seriously. Uh, uh, even though the elections are not necessarily open to every candidate, once they happen, there is a lot of campaigning, there is a lot of give and take there. Iran, for instance, in this conference, we have a former Iranian president. I don't think in the Middle East you find many countries or any countries that actually have a living former head of state that ended his term, uh, stepped down at the end of, end of his term. Uh, and you don't have a case where a president in the region goes to the polls and comes back embarrassed, particularly at the time when he's at loggerheads with the international community. And uh, it is not only at the national level. I mean, Iranians, I think, have had nine presidential elections and, uh, and several times that parliamentary elections. Uh, and, you know, maybe at the, at the national level they may, uh, they may vote along important things like democracy and the like. But a lot of uh, democratic political activity happens at the local level in Iran. And in the municipal elections, people are not voting for grandiose ideas. They're voting for bread and butter issues. And uh, what we're seeing in Iran is that its political debate is um, somewhat different maybe in the rest of the region. It's not about Islamic issues like in the Arab world. It's not about uh, democratization per se. But there's a lot of issues that we see also in Latin America. The economic reforms that uh, Hussein referred to uh, um, created the same kind of conditions that you have in Eastern Europe and Latin America, namely uh, during a privatization phase, during an economic restructuring phase, certain segments of Iranian society, the middle class, uh, the private sector did substantially better. And then you ended up with a populist backlash. And where you have elections, as you had in Iran in 2005, there's an occasion for that popular backlash to uh, reflect its, uh, its sentiment. And that was reflected in the election of a populist uh, leader who I think uh, should be very easily understood in terms we understand Evo Morales, Chavez, the populist, leftist, anti-American, uh, uh, anti a globalization wave that's swept across Latin America. And now we're seeing that the Iranian uh, 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 political system is, is recalibrating and readjusting because the populist president was not able to deliver on the economic promises that elected him. I mean, the Iranian public, I don't think, support his hardline rhetoric on the Holocaust or uh, the belligerent attitude towards the international community. Uh, they didn't elect him for that. That was not part of his 2005 rhetoric. They elected him for economic issues, and they had a chance to uh, express the sentiment that he hasn't done the job. And I think, you know, the important lesson is when we look at Iran, we understand that it has real politics. It's not a country that is, can be reduced to a particular leader that the international community may not like. Let me ask uh, Mohammed Reza to talk a little bit about politics, either in the sense of, of you know, what's up in the next elections or a question that interested me a lot when I was in, in Iran, which is we all have images of, of the Iranian Revolution of 1979 still fixed in our head. But I wonder if, if in the 
larger political sense, Iran is becoming a post-revolutionary country, passing from, from the, the, the place who, the, whose images we remember to, to something different. And in that sense, give us your thoughts about where Iranian politics will be in five years. <clears throat> well, I think there's nothing simple about Iran. And uh, Iran, West has found Iran very difficult to comprehend, understand, and come, in, come to terms with, just like Iranian themselves. I can't even explain exactly what's going on in Iran, uh, uh, never mind the pr predicting. I think in Iran we should predict weekly, not, not monthly or uh, annually, never mind five years. Uh, so. I really can't answer this question. But uh, regarding the first part of your question, I think yes, Iran is a post-revolutionary society, not a post-revolutionary government. And uh, even within the government, we have uh, clear political factions with which function, and uh, we've, have, we've had what I call economization of politics in Iran, which, which is a secular process. And, has nothing to do with uh, revolutionary uh, features. So I think that society is uh, post-revolutionary. When you go to Iran, you can see it evidently. Uh, in the streets, you can't see uh, many signs that remain from the, uh, the revolutionary culture as opposed to uh, 1980s, where in the 80s where you could see those signs a lot. Um, Iran is a very pluralistic society. Uh, there's, there's a lot going on which is quite difficult to capture. Uh, it's a much more diverse society than what is being uh, portrayed of Iran in the Western media. It's a much, it's, it has much more capacity for internal uh, economic progress, economic progress and uh, political reform. Um, it has people can express their views; they can say their minds uh, to a, a cons uh, significant, to a considerable amount of uh, degree, uh, and. In the cultural and social sphere, you can see that as time goes by, the Western modernity element of Iranian identity, along with the uh, Islamic identity and the pre-Islamic Persian identity, is uh, playing a more significant role. And it is more crucial in defining what it means to Iranian as time goes by. Uh, Hussein, what, uh, what thoughts do you have about the political situation? See, I think if, if you want to see whether we are post-revolution or not, there is a simple uh, figure which would indicate uh, which generation you are now facing in Iran. 65% of the Iranians now are under 25 years. So this means that they have been, I mean, they were born just uh, uh, after revolution. So you're facing a new generation. Uh, that are quite vibrant, dynamic, educated, would like to engage with the world internationally. But that does not mean that there are not uh, revolutionary elements over there, not in terms of people, but in terms of also some, some values. I would uh, attribute the revolutionary uh, fever, which uh, is remaining there, to, uh, to the uh, outside pressures. The more pressures Iran has had and has received uh, and has been applied by foreigners, the more radicalization uh, has taken place in the country because there is a sense of strong nationalism in Iran and uh, once they feel a threat from outside, then they get more united. Here you are facing a country where it has uh, started a new uh, development after revolution, but has always been ignored by the uh, strongest power of the, of, of the world, the United States, has always been threatened. The very existence of regime has always been under threat. So a feeling of insecurity in the country is, uh, is there. 
And in order to uh, overcome this feeling of insecurity, well, there are some uh, revolutionary feathers that uh, must be kept in order to defend itself. Uh, therefore, I guess that uh, we are post-revolutionary society now, except for the part that when uh, pressures are applied, so you have some reaction, it's a defensive reaction, and uh, the way to do it is to go to some revolutionary kind of behavior. That, uh, and this is also uh, uh, quite uh, true on the uh, developments that uh, Valley was referring to. It was not only the backlash of economic, uh, fast economic uh, uh, growth in, the, in the, um, some 15 years after the war, and of course that uh, created lots of uh, social imbalances which I agree that uh, the populist approach was to some extent or to great extent the reaction to that. There was also a reaction to the uh, political uh, frustration that uh, during Khatami's uh, period we have seen a, a true uh, rapprochement uh, that, and olive branches that were extended by President Khatami to the West in general and to the United States in particular but that didn't work uh, of the uh, cooperation that sincerely Iran uh, extended to the United States in Afghanistan, it was rewarded or reprimanded by uh, calling Iran access of evil. So uh, on the uh, elite level also, you see that the, there was some frustration that all these kind of rapprochement or uh, kind of positive attitude towards uh, the United States have not been working and uh, therefore it uh, uh, created uh, a sense that, well, uh, uh, the others who are hardliners should, should come and should uh, change their tone of the world. I, I, I know the, the Davos message would be keep working at, uh, at rapprochement. But let me turn to Bahara, who asked me if she could, if she could go last uh, and, and, and get her English uh, to, uh, to uh, Davos levels. Bahari, um, I know that uh, this audience um, would be fascinated to hear something about the status of women in Iran. When I was there, you know, certainly um, there, there are rules uh, that, uh, that seem to be uh, constricting, but people push against those rules. Women, you know, the, the, the number of different ways you can wear your hijab to express yourself is, is striking. People, although women wear cloaks in public, there's certainly many different kinds, uh, uh, you know, uh, shapes, etc. And uh, just tell us a little bit, uh, as, a, as a young Iranian woman, uh, what your sense is of these issues. Okay. Uh, yes, I think that one of the most uh, usual and common stereotypes about Iran and Iranian society is concerned with the Iranian women. Most of people in other countries think that Iranian women are very limited and confront to uh, many discriminations. But I prefer to present another alternative view about this subject. And uh, I, at first I draw the picture, the real picture, which takes uh, its rise in the inside Iran. And uh, then I try to show the causes and the reasons of this picture. Okay, I think that one of the aspects which is uh, usually ignored uh, by the um, West media or the, uh, I don't know, West public opinion uh, is that the Iranian women, especially new generation, uh, is, are, uh, are very um, educated. Most of them goes to the university and so they have the academic uh, education. I think that uh, two factors uh, which uh, possible this picture is that the women can be educated. One of them is that Islamic revolution. Uh, I, do, I know that the public, the West public opinion have the against, but I think that the Islamic revolution uh, help very much to the women to the, go to the university. Because uh, before Islamic evolution, most of uh, religious traditional families 
think that the university environment is not suitable for women. And uh, it can have, I don't know, some factors to be deviance of the young women. After Islamic Revolution, the people, the families, most of families trust to the university and open universities to the women, and most of them go to the university. And one of the, one, another factor that, uh, which helped to, the women to be educated is that uh, the academic uh, education in Iran is free. The government pay the expense of that. And so the women uh, have no uh, financial problem to, the, to be educated. And so, some of them, a traditional cultural, uh, we have cultural tradition in Iran, uh, which is law also, that in Iran, uh, men are responsible for uh, providing the expense of family, so that the young men uh, try to get the job as soon as possible, and the women have more time to spend for education, literature, etc. So we have, uh, um, for example, these factors, as a result of these factors, uh, we have in Iran interact exam. And 65% six, uh, of people that um, try to enter the university are women, and most of successful are women too. And in literature, the women are uh, most successful, more successful than men. For example, uh, most of novels that uh, get the prize, which uh, is written by women. And uh, for example, one of, uh, 10 of 13 books, which uh, are about very much, uh, are written by the women. And in a sport, in, for example, literature and education, because that factors I mentioned, the women have more spend time and time. There's a, a book that many of us have probably read called Reading Lolita in Tehran, uh, which gave a sense of a kind of almost a secret cultural life that women in Iran have as they think about, about personal issues, about, about issues of modernity. Um, I don't know if you've read that book, but um, yeah. what's your sense of, of, the, of that theme, that there is a sort of secret underground life almost of Iranian women? Uh, okay, I think that most of novels by, uh, is written by the women, for, uh, which uh, the women uh, live inside Iran, for example, Zoya Pirzad, and most of uh, writers in Iran, which uh, the books uh, can bout very much, uh, they, uh, they write, uh, yes, personal issues, personal problems, and paradox with the tradition and modernity, for example, especially women, but I think that the women have more potential to uh, create new styles of life and uh, solve uh, paradox of tradition or the modernity. Uh, no refuse tradition, no refuse modernity. They uh, try to, uh, yes, uh, um, take a relationship between tradition and modernity. And yes, in that book, personal issues, personal problems, which is, uh, for example, in Iran, women, yes, men should be um, pay the expense of the family, but most of women have the part-time uh, employed, employed uh, part-timely, and so they have, I don't know, uh, the conflicts between their roles. For example, as a mother, as a secretary, as a, a manager, as etc., and they have conflicts, and they show them in the novels, yes. Um, Shreyer, one form of, uh, of uh, literature, if you will, I think that's the wrong word, uh, is the blogosphere. Um, it, it, well, a little known fact about Iran is that it has a very dynamic uh, blogosphere in Persian, uh, just, just tens of thousands of, of blogs. And I, I want to ask you, um, as someone who I know um, travels in, uh, in that web world, what, you know, what are your favorite uh, Persian blogs? When you're home in Tehran, what do you look at? And if we could read your um, favorites list on your computer 
and look at, at some of that, uh, some of those blogs. What would we know about Iran that we don't know? Yeah, you know, there are plenty of Bilaks, Persian Bilaks, and uh, uh, actually it's estimated that there are 700 thousands of Persian Bilaks, Bilaks in Persian, and that would be the fourth or the fifth uh, language in the blogosphere of the world. That's quite astonishing for me and I think for you also. There's so many blogs that I want to read, and uh, because of the number, actually I use some kind of blog reader that at uh, least for me the most, the, the most recently posted posts um, uh, on different issues I'm, uh, that I, is my concern. I'm, uh, I read blogs on economy, on media issues, uh, blogs by my friends, and technology. Do you, do you have your own blog? Uh, actually, not because it, uh, I think it needs a lot of time, but I tried it a few times, but I had no <laughs> time to update my blog, so I abandoned that. And what's the, what's the hottest um, blog right now in Tehran? I mean, the one that people say, oh, did you look at uh, such and such dot, uh, dot whatever, dot IR? You know, I think that there are so uh, rich diversity as blogs that each uh, sector of the people have their own favorite blogs. And you cannot find uh, a blog as the most read blog in Persian. There's quite uh, uh, hot blogs for uh, each group of people. You cannot find just one blog which is the most uh, favorite blog. Mohamed Reza, what's, what's, what, what do you read to stay in touch when you're in Oxford? And, you know, for Iranians like you who are studying outside the country, what's, what, what are the things that you think about when you, when you, when you read, read the newspapers from Tehran? Uh, what, 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 what would you like to bring back to Iran from your time at Oxford? Mm, I mostly read uh, political blogs, which are quite uh, popular in Iran. Among them, uh, the reformist ones, I think, are the most popular. And uh, there are a couple of political activists are, who are mainly, who are usually members of uh, political parties in Iran, the reformist ones. And, uh, they are, and they express their political activity through weblog, I mean, the main channel for their uh, political activity is their weblog. Um, Recently, one of the things that amazed me is that, uh, <clears throat> contrary, contrary to my uh, expectation, uh, the Iranian uh, web bloggers are uh, increasingly sensitive towards the, the foreign intervention, uh, for, foreign intervention, and especially U.S. military uh, strikes on Iran, uh, and. That is uh, not without good reason. Um, of course, Iran has been attacked by uh, Britain and Russia and invaded by both in both uh, world wars. Uh, it was its first legitimately elected government was overthrown by um, Eisenhower's and Churchill's government in 1953, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, Iranians have not forgo forgot that uh, when Iraq attacked Iran, the West stood back and even helped Iraq. But uh, a few months ago, I was uh, quite annoyed that uh, I didn't see any uh, reflection of what I hear in the West of the possibility of military attack against Iran in the weblogs and Iranian newspapers. But uh, I was uh, delighted to see that uh, at last we are seeing a uh, uh, gradual sensitivity uh, towards the uh, foreign intervention in Iran. And, and I'm not talking about the, uh, the pro-conservative the pro weblogs. Even, even the most radical uh, reformists who I know who have a famous weblog have uh, have tried to somehow address this issue. And I think if, if uh, even, even the prospect of an attack on Iran, never mind the uh, actual attack, is going to unite 
even the most radical reformists uh, behind the Islamic Republic. And uh, this is not going to make uh, more hearts and minds uh, friendly towards Western culture, because I think the society of Iran is, has a much more friendly uh, approach to the Western modernity uh, compared to other Middle Eastern countries. But an attack, will, an attack on Iran and even the threat of an attack will reduce this in the near future. Uh, Bali, let me ask you about, 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 about what you read on, on the blogosphere, but, but also on, on what Mohammed Reza was just talking about. When, when people ask you, and you're, you're one of the leading Iran experts in the United States, whether you think there's going to be a war between the United States and Iran, what do you, what do you answer? Um, let me actually, if, if I may, before getting Please. there, build on what was said. Uh, you know, talk of blogs sometimes uh, can actually trivialize the quality of information in Iran, as opposed to just the sheer quantity. And I think that's very important to note. When in the United States, at least in the West, people think about Iran, they think it's an information poor country, that if you somehow could pry it open with uh, uh, information, things would change. And it's important to sort of look at it differently. Uh, it, it, that actually is not the case. Uh, for instance, um, uh, it's not just in the blog sphere. If you looked at publication of books in Iran, on the quality of debate on uh, Western literature. I mean, the very first time in recent years when I went to Iran, about uh, seven years after a long time, I was shocked that you open a, a Tehran daily and there's full-page debates between Foucault and Derrida in Persia. That uh, about a year and a half ago, an American philanthropist asked me that uh, he was willing to foot the bill for mass translation of Western works to Iran because somehow that was going to transform Iran if the Iranians somehow saw Western works. And I told him, okay, tell me what would you like to be translated? And literally every book he said, I said, that's already in Persian. And then I gave him a statistic. I said that there have been more translations of Immanuel Kant in Persian in the past five years than into any other language in the world. And some of these have gone into multiple printing. I know, uh, you know, uh, uh, Iranians see all kinds of television programming in the world. Uh, they read everything that Washington Post, New York Times prints, and the blogs, one of their functions is that they boomerang this very widely in society. Um, most of the people who think about Iran don't think that uh, there are a number of uh, mathematics and applied physics institutes in Iran that rank about in the top ten in the world. For instance, Iran has some of the leading research centers on uh, string theory physics. It has now fairly developed stem cell research industry in Iran. It's, uh, it's not just nuclear energy they're, they're concentrating on, particularly biotechnology is fairly advanced. Uh, essentially, what I'm trying to say is that it is, a, it is an isolated country because of things that Hussein said, because the world has kept it isolated, because also some of the characteristics of its regime does so as well. But it is a fairly sophisticated, literate country. I mean, the literacy rate in Iran is over 70%. In its most backward province, it's about 68%, which dwarfs some of the countries around it. It's scientifically very well advanced, and uh, that is part of the fabric of society. I often say in Washington, as you said, that Iran's regional ambitions, Iran's desire to be a hegemon, is not driven by a leadership. It comes from the dynamism, economic uh, force, cultural force that is coming from that society. And it's a very, very heavy task for the West to try to deny Iran, to deny a population, I don't mean a regime, deny a population what it believes to be at this point in time its rightful place in history and its rightful place in the Middle East. And I think you know, an overt effort to do that uh, is not seen by the Iranian public as punishment of the misdeeds or, or uh, transgressions of a regime, but it will be seen as a distinctly anti-Iranian act. And that will have uh, nationalistic repercussions, as was said, at a, at a very deep level. And I don't mean just gut-level gut nationalist feeling of coming in the street with clenched f fists. I mean, the West has an opportunity to either include and embrace a rising social cultural force in the region, a country of 70 million, or to turn it into an adversary, culturally, into an adversary. And I think that's as much the West's choice as it's the Iranians' choice. Let me turn uh, finally to uh, Hussein uh, before opening the, the floor to questions from, from our audience. 
And Hussaina, I'd ask you to talk about what really is the most difficult, but, but probably the most important issue of all right now in terms of Iran's relationship with the West, and that is the nuclear program. Bali expressed very clearly that this is a technologically advanced society that is pushing uh, for, for technological achievements in every sphere, and one of them, to the distress of the West, is nuclear energy. And, and to, to talk about the nuclear issue, if you would. Uh, may uh, comment on what uh, uh, Vali just uh, mentioned, that uh, there is, in, in these days, there is some sort of uh, concern on the part of some uh, countries in the region that Iran uh, would like to have to be the hegemon of the region, uh, and uh, they, they, there is some sort of reactions and some uh, very difficult reactions that are, we, we can witness. I would uh, subscribe to what Vali said, that uh, the emergence of Iran is uh, uh, because of several reasons. One is that after the war, Iran's economy has grown. We were uh, some sixth economy of the region. Today, we are the first economy of the region. So this is a fact, and this is the result of the uh, uh, economic dynamism and reforms that have been applied to the economy. Uh, we uh, were able to rise from the ashes of war to the peak of uh, economic uh, activities. We are the first uh, exporter of many manufacturing products of, in the region. We are the 12th car manufacturing of the world. We have our own brand of the car. We have been able to export it to, from Africa to Latin America to Middle East. We have lots of exporters or, or in civil uh, works, in housing, in uh, uh, roads, uh, re bridges, we are doing it in Pakistan, we are doing it in the Persian Gulf region, we are doing it in Africa, in, uh, everywhere. So that is one factor. The second factor, of course, recent development after 9-11 uh, and the American presence in, in, uh, uh, in the region, I'm afraid to say it has all been uh, to the benefit of Iran. It has uh, destroyed the one enemy of Iran uh, in the east, which is Taliban, and the other enemy of Iran in the, in the West, which was Saddam. Therefore, Iran uh, is emerging as the result of its own uh, natural uh, uh, characteristics. It does not have any intention to have be the hegemon of, of, of the region. The balance of power in the region has changed. The uh, countries in the region used to uh, think of Iran as an enemy of Iraq and being contained because of all of that, this has changed now, and of course, uh, all countries, including Iran, should live with this change. But on nuclear issue, uh, on the nuclear issue, you see, uh, people often uh, confuse Iran with North Korea. And I guess that there is a lot of uh, difference between Iran and North Korea. In North Korea, we are dealing with a bomb. In Iran, uh, you have a country where everybody is saying that we don't want bomb, we don't want to weaponize our technology, we have not any intention. Uh, Iran is a member of MPT. Iran has allowed all inspectors to be in the country. We have 24 hours inspectors stationed in Iran. We have cameras on, on all. And we have the uh, uh, Director General of uh, IAEA, uh, repeatedly saying that they have not found any indication of weaponization of this technology. Uh, of course, they also say that we have not yet uh, completed our research, but this is the case for all countries of the world. They have not ge given any clean certificate to any country in the world except one country, and that's Japan. So when it comes to the uh, continuing uh, inspection, well, this is something that goes uh, everywhere. On, on the other hand, uh, you are facing uh, a situation where you see that some countries are uh, testing uh, nuclear bombs and they are rewarded. I am afraid to say some of them are uh, our neighbors. And uh, they are rewarded by more technology, they are rewarded by more money. Therefore, I guess that the nuclear issue is uh, not uh, is a matter of concern as genuine, but uh, more important than that is the lack of trust between Iran and the United States in the first place, and maybe between Iran and uh, uh, some other countries uh, in the second place. Uh, nuclear issue in Iran, uh, the nuclear technology 
want to, wants to be used for the energy mix. We would like to diversify our energy mix, and we have to do it. A research which was done by Stanford uh, Research Institute in 1974 indicated that Iran needs 20,000 of uh, nuclear electricity by 1996, which is we are well behind that, and, and we would like to, do it, to have it by 2030. Therefore, Iran uh, is uh, uh, developing a capability in order to have uh, to partially uh, be able to uh, uh, produce its own uh, fuel for the nuclear power plants. And it, this is not going to be self-sufficiency. This is going to be just uh, uh, giving some, some room for uh, defending against any sanctions. If, if at that time we would be subject of any sanction, then we would be able to at least produce 10% uh, of the fuel required for the uh, power plant. Therefore, I guess that uh, the uh, uh, developments in the region, together with the uh, mistrust that's existing between Iran and the United States, and unfortunately this is an amazing case. In the past 27 years, Iran and the United States have been complaining from each other and exchanging lots of rhetorics in different terminologies, but they have never sit together to talk. And this is, uh, I guess, the single case in the, in the history that two countries have, are, are so much aggravating the tension uh, between themselves and have not been prepared to sit and talk to see what are the grievances, how they can address them. So it, that is uh, something that should be addressed, must be addressed, uh, addressed by both sides. And I guess that unless we overcome the matter of trust, we would not be able to solve any problem, including the nuclear issue. Let me turn to, uh, to our audience. Um, please uh, raise your hands, identify yourselves. Um, uh, please note the person to whom your question uh, is, uh, is directed. We have uh, about 15 minutes for your questions. Yes, sir. Frank Bruno from New York. Um, I just wonder if the panel has, uh, if you were the Israeli or Prime Minister of Israel today, um, how would you uh, interpret the comments from the elected leader of Iran and what would be your policy to deal with it? Do you want to direct that to a specific member of the panel? Uh, maybe uh, Mr. Nasser. Um, without a doubt, uh, uh, the, the comments of the Iranian president uh, towards Israel have been a source of concern for Israel. But the question is um, uh, what the, not just Israel but also the international community have to note is not to reduce the entire Iranian political system to Mr. Ahmadinejad. Uh, at least from my read, and others might uh, uh, differ, that the, he's not the head of state in Iran. He does not control the buttons. He does not appoint the commanders of the military. The, uh, Iranian, the head of Iranian state is the same person who's been there since 1989. And Mr. Ahmadinejad's actually future, I, at this point in time, I would say is rather in doubt, at least as far as the Iranian public are concerned. Now, he does pose a challenge. In other words, uh, one shouldn't uh, ignore or, uh, or not respond to particularly provocative issues like denial of the Holocaust. But the question is that uh, you could either, uh, uh, in combination with those objections, uh, leave the room for the Iranian people to vote him out, uh, or uh, you could adopt a policy that actually can end up where uh, Mr. Jalaipul was saying, where there would be a nationalist reaction in Iran which actually would strengthen his hand. I mean, for instance, in the West, we all very, very well understand that when 9-11 happened and when there is a threat to national security, everybody rallies behind their government, whether they like him or not. The last thing we want to do is to compel the Iranians to rally to Ahmadinejad. That, that definitely shouldn't be so, something that, that the West does. So it has to have a very nuanced approach. So you have to be tough and, and, and make reactions when necessary, but you also have to make sure that you don't sacrifice the positive trends in Iran uh, in the process. Hussein, did you have a thought about that? You see, I think that uh, these kind of things uh, uh, should not be taken as uh, being a representative of, uh, of the whole uh, country or the nation. I would like to refer to two points. One is, is historical, which uh, goes back to the Achaemenid dynasty when Iran was the superpower of the world in 530 BC. 
and uh, Cyrus the Great, when uh, it started to uh, expand its rule over uh, the Mediterranean uh, region and up to Egypt, <clears throat> was uh, able to liberate all the uh, uh, um, ethnic nations of the various uh, uh, parts of that uh, region and uh, give them the uh, uh, freedom of uh, practice of their uh, uh, traditions or cultures or uh, religions and including them and on top of them was the Jews and this is uh, quite uh, appreciated by the history by the uh, uh, Jewish people themselves that uh, one of their great, great saviors was Cyrus the Great. Uh, and also I would like to read, so this is a historical fact that Iranians are quite uh, uh, oriented to the culture of tolerance and culture of diversity and respecting the other's uh, uh, rights. But uh, I would like to refer to the official statement of the foreign ministry that I, I uh, recall <clears throat> that uh, it was issued uh, after uh, some of these uh, statements, and that uh, uh, said in, in, in a way, indirectly, uh, was addressing the issue, saying that Iran respects all members of the United Nations, which I'm sure that uh, um, everybody understands what does it mean, and uh, would not have any intention to uh, take any action against or attack against any any United Nations members, and that would indirectly mean uh, all countries in the region. Yes, please. Sally Besbe, I work for Associated Press. I live in um, Cairo. I actually asked, wanted to ask Mr. Kaljayi and Ms. Arvin, um, one of the most intriguing things that Mr. Nasser, for example, is saying is that normal, ordinary people in Iran who are not involved in politics um, are concerned about this unfortunate confrontation with the United States either fearful or um, having strong feelings of nationalism, that, you know, this sort of thing. And I'm curious about that from both of you who, you know, are normal business people involved in, like you said, more interested in blogs on technology than anything else. How do you feel about this tension? Are you fearful? Are you feeling nationalistic? I mean, are you, you know, how do you feel about the U.S. confrontation with Iran? Not on any sort of political level, just your, your, Reaction, emotional reaction to it. Um, when we, uh, in the West these days, when we talk about uh, Iran, they talk about the romance of ancient Persians, uh, Persian empires, or they talk about a very dramatized black and white Iran. Uh, my first concern is the image of Iran, which is in reality a great scale of different facts and uh, complex things. Uh, I think that the first, my, my first fear is the image. You know, the image is everything and it uh, allows uh, a community to attack these people or uh, make them to think again about the situation. So my first uh, fear is about the image, which is really a, a very black and white and uh, I think a very dramatized and uh, not real image of the realities inside Iran. Uh, anyway, I think that most of the people in Iran really think about a peaceful uh, situation where, uh, where they are only con uh, focused on expanding their internal capacities. So they really want to avoid the situation. Bah Bahari? I think that uh, if uh, people, uh, ordinary people in Iran live ordinary life, everyday life, and have everyday life, but I think that if the uh, if Iran threatened uh, by the, any other country, ordinary people support the Iran and nationalism uh, increase. Because uh, all, although we have in Iran many problems, or for example economies, Unemployment, inflation, etc. But uh, when the, uh, for example, the Iran, the whole of the country, is threatened by any other country, the ordinary people support the uh, the whole of the country and 
and prepare to pay the expense, any expense, for example, for the Iran, because yes, they um, they like their country, and so they have many problems. But they, I think that the ordinary people, if uh, they feel the serious threaten, serious threats, they support. Uh, there was a gentleman here in the back. Thank you very much, Jean-Pierre Lehmann, IMD. Uh, two questions. One to Mr. Nasser. I think the question is why is it that the United States, at least official United States, seems to be so incredibly ignorant about Iran? And I've been to Iran, I've been to North Korea, and the point that you make is that these are not comparable countries. So there must be some kind of problem of, of communication or perhaps a lack of willingness to, to, to uh, understand. That was my first question. The second question is that where, where is Iran's application in WTO? Is that moving forward? Uh, when can we expect to have uh, um, uh, uh, Iran joining the organization? Thank you. Good. Bali and then Hussein. Well, uh, uh, I would say at least my read of it is, is, uh, is that the perception of Iran uh, in, in, in the United States at the higher levels of the government is a function, has been a function of two things. One is, is a function of absence of relations. In other words, there's no embassy. There's no routine way of learning about a society the way in which official governments learn about one another. Um, uh, so, you know, you rely on all kinds of secondary information, some of it good, some of it bad. And, and uh, as a result, the United States has, has shifted all the way from thinking of Iran as a society on the verge of a democratic revolution that all it needs is a good example in Iraq for it to rise up to thinking that this society is, is unchangeable and you need to be tough uh, and confrontational with it. And the second issue is that often, uh, particularly in recent years, uh, and not just in Iran, in many other quarters in the West, the approach to Iran has been largely ideological, uh, as viewing uh, essentially uh, a, a mandate for spread of democracy of a certain kind. And, and, uh, and that has become the, the, the context in which Iran is understood. For instance, um, many of the overtures that, um, that uh, Hussein referred to that Iran made uh, did not, were not taken seriously because there was no interest in engaging a government uh, if you thought that that government would be replaced anyway. So why talk to Iran? if Iran's not going to be there, or, or the statement often became, well, well, why would you talk to, a, to, a, to evil, quote-unquote. And, um, and I think that the combination of these two has created a, a, a sort of unpragmatic approach to Iran. And uh, the whole sophistication of Iranian society, of Iranian politics, and the size and, uh, uh, of the country and the issues that now confront Iran and the U.S. and the multiple arenas that they confront one another actually requires to both sides, in fact, to step out of idealism and to think pragmatically, and that's the only way in which we could move forward. So, Hussein, how soon might we get to, uh, to WTO membership? You see, on WTO, we applied in 1997. Uh, we were very much rejected by the United States uh, to be put on the agenda of consideration whether uh, our application should be considered or not. So, uh, it took us some seven, eight years in order to convince the United States that at least to accept that we would be put on the agenda application. So finally, <clears throat> uh, they said that we are going to give uh, this concession to Iran to let Iran be put on the agenda. Then uh, we uh, said that we are ready for, <clears throat> for uh, starting our negotiation, <clears throat> but then we were again stopped by the United States, and we are at the, now at the stage where uh, we are uh, waiting for the United States also to give its green light because uh, the uh, decision-making in WTO is a consensus in the, uh, uh, in the Council. Uh, then um, if, if it is uh, accepted, we would be ready to give uh, our report on trade regime and start uh, uh, negotiating with all parties, including the United States. I guess that uh, in that uh, setting, Iran and the United States must uh, sit together and at least talk on the various uh, exchange of concessions on the trade. Uh, but on, on, the, on the first point that uh, uh, the gentleman uh, uh, said, I, I would comment that, uh, you see, the United States from the very beginning did not accept the uh, realities of revolution, that a country under a dictatorship would like to 
free itself. And it was seen more as, uh, as a kind of uh, religious revolution, whereas it was a, a freedom revolution, which uh, under the banner of Islam, of course. Uh, <clears throat> it was <clears throat> set to create democratic uh, institutions, as we see that in Iran after revolution, we have had uh, quite meaningful uh, parliament, a parliament which is r rightly and correctly uh, elected by the people, and there are quite uh, lively debates, debate about everything. Uh, of course, we are talking in a relative terms, especially uh, compared to all uh, Middle Eastern countries. Uh, so from that beginning, they thought that this regime is going to be changed, and they are going to uh, support any kind of activities in order to change the regime. So they waited for the regime to be changed, and this is now three decades that this, nothing has happened. We have now a new generation which are quite uh, happy with the democratic institutions that they have, and they are pushing uh, the borders of democracy even further beyond. Uh, sometimes uh, we can compare it with the uh, early times of the revolution. We see that it is pushed beyond the red uh, lines of, of what we used to have it by the young, and this is inevitable, that the young and women are uh, taking over the, the country in the, in the, in the next uh, maybe decade. I, with apologies to those who, who have their hands raised, um, I'm, uh, we've reached the end of this session. I want to leave all of you time to get to the plenary session on the future of the Middle East, which I have to get to. Um, I, I hope that we fulfilled our promise to give you the flavor of what you'd hear if you went to Tehran, which was very lively debate. Um, you know, all of the people who joined this panel um, were stepping out and trying to be as honest and open as they could. We webcast uh, this uh, session so people in Iran will be able to listen to it and join in the conversation. But please uh, join me in thanking all of our panelists for this Voices from Tehran. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Very good. Uh,